Hi everyone and welcome to this video where I'm going to talk you through Jordan's mock driving test from the perspective of a driving test examiner. Now I've been a driving instructor for about 20 years now and I've been on hundreds of driving tests sitting in the back of the car as they happen. So I know exactly what I'm talking about, I know the good and the bad and what examiners are looking for and I'm going to talk you through what I'm thinking as I'm marking Jordan on this test. So we're just doing the show me tell me at the moment, this is the tell me part where I asked him to tell me how you check if your indicators are working. Now he did get it slightly wrong because he said that he'd turn them on and look at the screen and see if the lights are flashing on the screen. Now the real answer is that you turn them on, get out of the car and then you check if the indicators are on, you just look at them from outside the car. Sometimes examiners, they're not looking for exact answers, so if you give an answer which is slightly off, they will often accept it, then even if you get that wrong, I don't know where this comes from, but there's this myth about you fail your test if you get it wrong. That's just nonsense, you don't fail the test. Normally, you get one small fault if you get it wrong. I'm going to turn left, and then we'll turn immediately right. Now, I've mentioned this before in videos, but when test examiners say, or when anyone says, turn left, then immediately turn right, they mean it's immediate. So we turn left, and the right turn is coming up here. You'll be amazed how many people just go sailing straight past this turn and go up the road. And you've already added about five minutes on to your driving test by doing that. Now people have this thing about if you go the wrong way, then you can cheat because you'll miss out some part of the route. That's not true at all. If you go the wrong way, you'll simply turn around whenever it's possible and come back and complete the route. So if you go off route, all you're doing is making it harder for yourself because you're extending the route, you're having to do more work. They're not going to just let you drive off the route, so you must stick to the route. I've only ever had one exception to that where the people, actually two, no, three exceptions that I can think of, three tests where the people took the wrong turn so many times they were almost completely lost. I mean, they were going round and round in circles and they drove on the same road pretty much the whole test. <laughs> Anyway, if we now pull up on the right, you notice he puts it into reverse and starts reversing. And you might think when you watch the other video, which will be linked in the description, and I'll put a link on the screen in the information cards as well. You might think I'm being a bit picky when I said to him, stop, I haven't told you what to do just yet. That's what the examiners will do. If you start to do something and they haven't asked you to do it, then they'll just say, stop, you know, I haven't said reverse yet. And you can tell if you pull up on the right, you are probably 99% certainly going to do the right reverse manoeuvre. But don't just assume that. I remember having tests before where pupils have just turned. <laughs> and I remember once in, uh, in Redditch, you might remember I did a funny driving test in Redditch. I did one there once and the examiner said, can you pull up on the left? And I said, well, I'm really pleased you just took that turn, but I didn't ask you to. And the pupil just went... Oh no, <laughs> they just turned on the road that we normally go on, but it's not the road that the examiner wanted them to go on. So do be careful, do wait for the examiner to tell you what to do. They're not being funny, they're not trying to be some kind of you know power trip or whatever. It's just if they haven't told you to do it, then you don't necessarily need to do it. So we're now carrying on at the road, and you'll see from the pedal camera that the pupil is keeping the foot around the clutch pedal, this is a point I've made many times before. Yes, it's better to have your clutch, to have your left foot by the side of the clutch, but you don't have to. It's only bad if you're pressing the clutch pedal down. So if you're pressing the pedal down slightly as you drive, or you're resting your foot on the pedal, that's wrong, that's bad. And there's a page on my website all about coasting. But what he's doing now with his foot over the clutch is perfectly acceptable, especially when you drive in a city like Birmingham. You're going to be doing clutch up, down, up, down all the time. It's actually more tiring to keep moving your foot left, right, left, right from the rest area back over the pedal than it is just to keep your foot over the pedal in the first place. So we're coming up the road now, and you'll notice I'm watching the people there. My eyes were looking at the people. Well, it's not like my nose will be looking at the people, is it? <laughs> my eyes were watching the people, seeing if he was checking his mirrors. And we're going to pull over on the left here. And they will often say things like, pull up anywhere. And I've had people before say, that's wrong because an examiner would never say pull up anywhere. Remember, I've been on over 400 driving tests 
I've met dozens of different examiners and they've all said pull up anywhere on the left, disregard driveways on this occasion. That's why they're told to say it's like a script. They're told to say disregard driveways on this occasion. It doesn't matter because we're not teaching them to pull up and block a driveway. It's simply to see if they can pull up and move off again. So blocking a driveway for a few seconds is not important because we're going to move off again straight away. If they say pull up somewhere safe, then it must be somewhere safe, as in not blocking a driveway. But you've got to remember that if you were that picky about things, no one would ever pass. If they said pull up somewhere safe, I mean look at this road, there's hardly anywhere, there's bends, there's hills, there's parked cars, there's driveways, there's vans. It will be almost impossible to get somewhere safe on every single road. So there is a little bit of leeway given. Now at the end of the road, we're going to turn left. And this is where many people fail on this test route. You can't really tell from this camera, from the, the many different cameras in the car. But if you look to the right now past the pupil, that view is really, really bad. Notice how much is looking and creeping and looking and creeping. And I'm looking, even after he goes, I'm still looking. That is a really, really bad view. And a lot of people fail there because they come out as they normally would. And they just don't appreciate how bad the view is. So we're going to take the next road on the right in a moment. By this big white house. And as you turn in, I'm going to ask him to pull up again on the left. Some people may not understand why we do this. It's what you call an angled start. So we ask him to pull up on the left just behind the big car. We don't use makes and models of cars because not everyone knows what they are. So I'll say pull up on the left behind that big grey car. And yes, again, we are blocking the driveway. We don't care about that on this occasion. This is the angled start, so I ask him to move a little bit closer. And this is something on test which I always find quite funny. <laughs> and some examiners I know get quite frustrated about. The wording they're told, and by the way, notice there on that one, yeah, he's moving off procedure is slightly wrong. I will mention that at the end of the video, but if you watch the way he moves off, he's really good. This is a good pupil. He's at a very high standard and he's a very good, competent driver. But that's something a lot of people often get wrong, is if you signal before you've looked over your shoulder, then you do get marked down for that. That's one of the more serious faults you can get. And normally doing that three times will result in a fail, but there's no set number. It's always up to the examiner. Coming back to what I was just saying though about the thing the examiners get a bit annoyed about sometimes. They will ask you to pull up behind a car and leave just enough room to pull away again. So they'll say to you, can you pull up on the left just behind that vehicle? Leave about a car's length between us and them. And it's quite funny how people seem to do one of two things. They either pull up about five car lengths back. I remember once <laughs> the examiner said to the pupil, I did say a car's length, not a stretch limousine. <laughs> uh, all right, I mean, you could say a stretch limo is a car, but it was quite funny. The pupil pulled up like about, I don't know, so far back from the car, you could have fitted a stretch limo between us and them. And the other extreme is that pupils often tend to pull up right on the back of the car with about a millimetre between your bumper and their back bumper. And the examiner will say, well, you've got no room to move off. So when you're asked to pull up on the left behind a vehicle, as you always will be, because that's a, a mandatory part of the test, all you've got to do is pull up about a car's length away. So imagine that you've got like a Ford Fiesta between your front bumper and the car in front of you. A bit like those cars on the left there, that was a bit further than a, a Fiesta length, but just leave a few metres between you and the car ahead. Don't get too close. They're not as fussy if you're too far back. They do tend to say, okay, that'll do. They're quite lenient on that, but you should pull up reasonably close. So we're now going to take the next road on the right. And again, look how I'm checking the pupil. You will find many examiners seem looking there. Some examiners will sit sideways on and just stare straight at people. Now I do the same, but I don't make it so obvious. If you look at my eyes, watch my eyes in the video there, you'll see how my eyes move around a lot, but I don't move my head quite so much. I'm asking to pull up again here on the left, and he pulls up somewhere around this area. I'm asking to move off again. 
Now watch the way he moves off. I think he does this one properly if I remember. So he does. He does his mirrors in a moment. Centre mirror by mirror. Centre still looking in the centre. The one's behind us. So we're waiting for that car to pass. That's good. Don't indicate now. He checks mirrors, blind spots, signals. That's how it should be done. So let's be clear on this. You only have to check the centre mirror, the right mirror and the right blind spot if you're moving off from the left hand side of the road. Now some people get angry about this and especially cyclists say it's not right, you should be checking the left as well. That's just the way the rules are, right or wrong, that's the way they are. You only have to check the centre mirror, the right mirror and the right blind spot. Now I've been teaching that method for 20 years, I've never ever had a single people ever on a test be pulled up on that. And I have said before, you shouldn't use the test as a, a measuring stick just because you get away with it on the test or just because it's, it's accepted on the test doesn't mean you'll get away with it safely in real life. So it is good to look all around, but you don't have to. I know sometimes people have been confused by my videos would have said you don't look all around. You don't have to look all around, okay? The minimum is the centre mirror, the side mirror to the direction you're going to move and then the blind spot. Now on this one we're going to pull up and we're doing this between driveways and it's going to now be the independent part of the driving. This route doesn't involve a sat nav because as you may know one in five tests does not involve a sat nav. So most tests do, four in five do, but one in five it just involves following road signs. So on this one I've told him to turn left to the end of the road and then follow road signs for, uh, where is it now, Birmingham Airport and Solihull. Now I know sometimes um, people leave comments to my video saying the examiner wouldn't help as much as you are. So on this video I've deliberately not helped at all. I have said that some of the signs are in awkward places and I have been on many tests where examiners have even told the people where the signs are. You must understand that the test is not quite strict as some people think. And if you watch here, when he turns left, the back wheel goes at the kerb. Just see if you can spot it when it happens. So coming up in a moment, we move off. Can you see it? It's very subtle on the video, you can't see much at all. But he did go at the kerb with the back wheel, which is no major problem. I've had people do that and pass. When we did the right reverse earlier on, I've actually had people who have ended up with two wheels, both of the right wheels on the pavement, and they've still passed on the right reverse. And this is where my experience comes in, because a lot of instructors either don't have my experience or they don't go on driving tests with people, and they're quite surprised that you'd be amazed yourself actually how many instructors might have been doing the job for years and they've never been on a driving test. But when you ask them why, they always say, oh, well, it's going to put people off. I find it doesn't put people off. I find it actually relaxes people because a lot of people have said to me, it's nice having someone in the car who's on my side. It's nice having you there because it feels more like a lesson. And you don't have to have someone go with you. If you don't want, that's fine. I never force people. I just give them the choice. But I would be wary of any instructor that won't go on a test with you. That's for a different video. But can you think of why some instructors won't go on tests with you even when you want them to. Now we just passed a sign there that said max speed 20. Do you know why you don't have to do 20? Now it did say when lights flash, which does say when lights show, but even if the lights are showing you don't have to do 20. Does anyone know why? Let me know in the comments below. So we're carrying on now and this is Quite an awkward part comes up here because it says road ahead closed. Now the road ahead is not closed. What it means is when it says road ahead, it means anywhere ahead. So you see the signs over the roundabout there. Road ahead closed means anywhere ahead. And if you look at the arrow, it actually points slightly to the left. And now it does point left. There's two arrows there. There's a small arrow on the red sign pointing diagonally top left. And it shows that the road that's closed is actually that side road, which is not exactly a road at all. It's more like a, a driveway up to the houses. But that was the road it meant was closed. 
And again, I didn't speak there because some examiners would, most would just say, it's okay, that's the other road that's closed. Examiners are not mean people. People have this idea that they're mean and they're nasty and they're going to shout at you and be angry. They're nothing like that. I mean, maybe there are some like that, but the ones I know around my area are great. They're really nice people. They, they don't exactly help you because they're not there to help you, but they are really good and they're friendly. Now, one thing I didn't mention here at the end of the test is there was a little bit of hesitation on his round of votes. We could have gone a little bit earlier, but we didn't. And there's a red card there, see, looking over my shoulder. That's the one I'm checking to see why the people came off in the right-hand lane. You see the bus stop there? Loads and loads of people. I've had this tons of times in lessons. People swerve to go round that bus stop where it says on the floor, bus stop. You don't have to swerve to go around bus stop markings. Now that may sound funny to experienced drivers watching this, but you'll be amazed how many people do that. They see bus stop on the floor and they just swerve around the words bus stop, nearly causing a crash. The bus stop is just a bus stop. You don't have to avoid it, you can drive through it. So we don't drive through the bus stop itself, you know what I mean, drive through the markings on the floor. How could you tell that? Well, quite simply, look at the markings on the floor here. They're broken. Any broken line normally means you can just cross it. You don't have to stop. You don't have to avoid it. Anyway, let's get back on with the driving now. We're carrying on towards the airport. And I don't know if you can see the signs on this video, but the signs are there. Strangely, most of the signs in this area are actually on the exit. So it's quite funny how the signs are on the exit to the roundabouts, which is why I said to the people at the beginning, they're in quite a strange place. So we're carrying on down the road. This is not a roundabout coming up, but a lot of people think it is, and people start braking, looking to the right. It's not a roundabout there, it's just a cut through of the dual carriageway. And asking to pull up again on the left here. Now the thing they want to see here is you're not going to pull up too close to the centre cut through. You can see, just about see, where that car's passing there. If you pull up by that cut through, you are blocking the road for anyone. I've seen a time here when I think it was a bus or a large van came through that little road on the right there and the people had pulled up on the left just there and they were blocking them and they failed for that because they did say pull over somewhere safe and that wasn't a safe place. So we're carrying on down the road now and there's about another five minutes, I think, of this independent driving. Now it's supposed to last for 20 minutes, but it's never dead on. Mm. I know some of the routes, it's only about 12 minutes, others it seems to be about 25 minutes. It's hard to get it dead on, but I think this is the last sign we follow for Birmingham Airport. And if you look on the left here, you can just about see the sign with the airplane on, saying straight on. It's quite hard to see on the video. It's that time of year when, um, this is a good camera that I use, it's a good dash cam, but they're not, not the best dash cams. So that's something I'll be looking at, getting some new cameras over the coming months. But these are pretty good. They are a little bit dark, I know the screen's a little bit kind of muddy and blurry, but, you know, it, it does the job, and it's, um, I've been using these cameras for years now. So we're carrying on now, and we're coming up to a roundabout, which causes many problems. This is one that loads and loads of people fail on. And the reason is, the road from the right has a speed limit of 30 miles an hour, but many people come up to it doing about 40 to 50. And there are lots of crashes on this roundabout. If you look at the markings, you maybe won't see this on the video, but if you look at the markings on the kerb, loads of vehicles have smashed into the kerb. I remember once having a pupil come off this roundabout and she went straight into the kerb and completely blew the tire to pieces. The test continued, but when I looked at it at the end, she'd smashed the alloy to bits on one of these big kerbs. They maybe don't look very big in the video, but it's that one on the right there, just on the approach, she came off, coming the other way on a different route, and she smashed the wheel to bits. And that was quite an expensive repair. Anyway, these things happen. When I get on the roundabout soon, this is another one. We could have gone slightly earlier, being a little bit hesitant, but not excessively. They'd rather see you be a little bit hesitant than be a bit too, you know, too positive and too aggressive and going at the wrong time. 
So we're going round the roundabout, and that's the end of that part of independent driving. We're now following a different sign for Warstock. I think there's only one of those signs. So we're going down the road towards another roundabout. This roundabout often causes trouble, and he didn't on this one. He actually did really well. But um, I don't know why, it's, it's a really good view. The view to the right is open and clear, as you'll see in a moment. You can actually see from quite far back, but for some reason people just stop for no reason. This is where a lot of people get marked down, because if it's clear to proceed, then you should do so. So the markings on the floor there, same right line ahead. I'm going to carry on down the hill, and you'll see this roundabout in a moment. It's a mini roundabout, and I don't know if you can see it from this far back on the video, but in real life, you can actually see the roundabout just as you pass where this van is parked up and where the other van's moving, where they're both moving off. So when you get to about kind of here, you can start to see the roundabout appear in the distance. So that the lorry just came over the roundabout. And you can start to see to the right, and the view's pretty good, and it's getting better and better. And many times, like we do on this occasion, you can just go. So you can see not to the left, and we just carry on. And I think if I remember, he does it well. So we just go straight on, and there you go. So you don't strictly have to indicate there. I don't think we did. Yeah, we did. He took it off there. You don't have to, but it does make it much clearer for everyone around if you do. Because he'd say, look, I'm not going to go over. I'm not turning right. I'm definitely coming off first exit. So we pull up again on the left, just here. And then this is not another angled start. This is one where we just pull over somewhere. I think we do anyway. I can't remember, I think we might carry on actually. Now it's the other time, think of a different test route. Sometimes on a different test route we pull over there, but on this one I didn't because we've already done it enough. Now sometimes it's worth mentioning that examiners do make mistakes on driving tests. I remember I was on a test about two months ago now, and the examiner had already done the bay parking manoeuvre at the very start of the driving test. And about five minutes in, he said to the pupil, can you pull up on the right? And I thought, well, this is a bit odd, because we've already done a manoeuvre. And he said, can you now reverse two car lengths like we did earlier on? And then <laughs> the examiner said, actually, no, forget that, we've already done the manoeuvre, haven't we? <laughs> so examiners do make mistakes, like I did there. I thought we were going to pull up on the left, and we didn't. In the video, we carried on. These things happen, and they overlook those things. There's only ever one examiner I had who's now moved away but um they would never admit they made a mistake and i remember once i made a huge clangor on a <laughs> dropped a clangor on a driving test they were coming to a roundabout and they meant to turn right just before the roundabout and they didn't say and i thought well that's weird he must have changed the route and the examiner got a bit short-tempered with the pupil and said you've missed a turn now we're gonna have to do a different route to get back to it and both me and the pupil knew that he hadn't said turn right. The people hadn't forgotten, they hadn't missed the turn. He'd forgotten to say turn right. So sometimes I make mistakes. Most examiners are great, they're all good people, very friendly, very easy to get on with, and they're really good at putting people at ease in general. So on this roundabout we're going towards Maypole. As you see on the sign there, it's called Maypole because on the 1st of May there's a big Maypole we have maypole dancing, which if you don't know, is like an old-fashioned... It's like, for those of you watching from abroad, it's like an old-fashioned dance. It's like people dress up with these funny-looking white costumes with bells on the socks and whatever. And they all dance around, holding ribbons, dancing around a pole. I don't know what all that's about, but I'm sure if you want to know more about maypole dancing, you can look it up. Strangely, I've never actually been to see it. I don't even know, even know if it's true. It's something people say they do it on May Day. I think it's May Day, 1st of May or whatever. I don't know. But um, I'm not really up with all these, you know, traditions and whatever. Anyway, we're going straight on to the roundabout. This roundabout is not on any sat-nav that I've got. I've got three different ones. It's not on any of them. So the people did well to see that. Now, we are going to take the next road on the right. But if you look ahead, there is a big reason people fail ahead which, to be completely honest, is one reason I didn't go ahead, because 
Um, if you look at the floor, what is on the floor? It's really hard to see. Watch that car coming towards us. See the bump? That is an absolutely massive bump and it's really hard to see. And if you go over that bump without seeing it, as many people do, the examiners will be on the brake as late as they can. But I remember a couple of years back now, I had a pupil and she went straight over that bump and I braked, but I didn't quite brake in time. And the front of the car smashed on the floor. Didn't do any damage because it was just a plastic under tray. There's a thing called the under tray under your car, which protects it from water and damage and whatever. But yeah, that got a bit scratched. But that taught me that whenever I come up to that roundabout, it's either to the bump, not the roundabout, I always brake a lot earlier or I ask people, you know, what's on the floor, why the cars come near the way slowing down. It's really hard to see that bump. And if you miss it, you can do serious damage. I've seen other cars there go over the bump and smash the bonnets into the floor. I remember once seeing, um, actually this was only about two weeks ago, there was someone driving a brand new Ferrari around that area and they were going over that bump so slowly, not that bump, but a similar one. They were driving over it so slowly. <laughs> they were doing about one mile an hour. I mean, if you've got a Ferrari, you don't want to be bumping on the floor. You may notice there the people swerved around something. That was really good, and I forgot to mention that at the end of the video. There was some kind of like metal, I don't know what it was, it looks like something from the bottom of a car. It's like a metal pipe or something was lying on the floor there. And we swerved around, not swerved, we moved around it, and that was really good. If, you, if he'd have driven over that, that could have come up and done some serious damage to the bottom of the car. And I know that because many years ago, sometime around 2008, let me think what year it would have been, 2000 and, it was either 2006 or 2008, because I now had a, a Ford Focus at the time. I was driving along a motorway once. I just heard this almighty boom. It was a massive bang. And I thought at first I had a flat tyre. So I pulled over on the hard shoulder, thinking I had a flat and the car behind me pulled over as well. And we both looked at our cars, and there was no damage whatsoever. And we both looked at each other, and it's so loud you can't speak, because when you stand next to a motorway, it's really, really loud. And we just kind of shrugged our shoulders at each other and sort of shook our heads and said, what was that? And it was about half an hour later, I parked up at a service station, and I was walking back to my car, and um, <laughs> the car was parked on top of a hill, and as I walked up the hill, I could see what that bang had been. There was actually a metal pipe that had come off the lorry, because just past when I heard this bang, there was a big lorry that had broken down the side of the motorway. And this bang had actually been a pipe, I don't know what it was, some kind of transmission pipe or an axle or something, had come off this lorry, and it had actually gone through the bottom of my car. <laughs> And I had this massive hole. It's funny because I wondered why it was so loud. I was thinking, why is, why is the road so loud? After I'd heard that bang. There was a huge hole the size of a fist in the bottom of my car. And there was actually a pipe sticking in to the bottom of my back floor. Going into the, not the back seats. <laughs> and I remember taking it to a garage. And the man at the garage did what they all do. And, dear, oh dear, that's going to cost a bit. And I think it was about £2,000 to repair that. But anyway, that's the importance of swerving around or steering around objects on the road. People are often surprised when they, they hit things and they're surprised they get marked down for it. But you do have to go around objects. So we turn left now, and this is a little Y junction which confuses people. Notice how the people looks to the right here. That's really good, because a lot of people don't look right there. It looks right about three times there. And a lot of people don't realise that's actually a junction. And they fail there because they pull out. And there are lots of those Y junctions around if you haven't seen them. If you're around this area, especially there are lots of them. So we're carrying now on towards the end of the road. This is almost the end of the test. Now at this point the examiner will be thinking these pupils doing really well. They're not gonna you know not, not gonna fake it so that you pass. But I know from talking to examiners off the record, away from the job, they do say, look, if you're doing really well and they're in the last few minutes, you are kind of willing them, you know, just keep it together. 
And you'll see a moment here where the people does really well to keep it together. If I remember, because I haven't watched this video for about a week now, a car comes towards us here quite quickly, and it might not look like it on the video, but they come around the bend a bit quicker than they should have, and we both have to kind of slow right down and give way. I think it's somewhere in the moment, there's that car sticking out there, it's not that one. It's another one comes around here, and we have to slow down, not suddenly, but we slow down well. I think it's somewhere around this corner, this car appears. Now he comes into the road, that could give way, but they don't. And they kind of almost forced the way through and they could have give way. So the people does really well there. And the other driver says, sorry, you know, messed up a bit there. And that's really good the way he handled that. That's the kind of thing I mean about keeping it all together. Because when you're on the way back, you might be interested to know, most driving tests have failed within the first or last two minutes. Did you know that? By far, most tests have failed in the first two minutes or the last two minutes. It's quite interesting because when police looked at crashes years ago, they found that a huge proportion of crashes happen within, I think it was half a mile of people's homes. Because when people get close to their home or they're driving away from their home, there's this psychological thing where I suppose they just think, oh, I know this road really well. And they kind of not concentrate as much as they could be. So on this junction, we were a little bit hesitant because that blue car, you can't see this in the video, but the driver of that blue car is actually telling us to go and the pupil doesn't go. So he puts the handbrake on and they're saying go, go, and we don't go. That again is not terrible because he's a little bit hesitant, a little bit of observation maybe could have been done there to see that. But again, we went up the curb there, just see that? The back tire went up the curb. It's not a major problem. If that had kept happening, it would have become more of a serious fault because we did have a slight bit of hesitation on the roundabouts slight bit of hesitation there but it's better to be a little bit hesitant than to be too positive these things come with time and it's easy when you're an experienced driver to look back and forget how you were when you first started driving that's why many schools have signs on the back of the car saying remember you were a learner once isn't it funny how many people forget that they were a learner once and some people think that they're perfect and never do anything wrong and it's always other people well those are the very worst drivers and i've always said in my videos i make mistakes we all make mistakes the difference is a good driver learns from mistakes and a bad driver won't admit that they've made a mistake so we're now going back into the test center and i know at this point the people's passed because he's only got i think four faults and if you wonder why I'm not marking throughout the test, that's often how it's done. It isn't always safe to be marking on the move. It's a little bit easier now because I use iPads so they can tap the iPad. I'm still using the old pen and paper method. But yeah, many times they won't actually mark you on the move. So yeah, we're coming back into the center and I now could pull the marks on the marking sheet and it's gonna be a pass which is good because you'll know if you watch my videos, it's quite hard to pass a mock test or a test in general. So I hope you've enjoyed this video and check out the other videos will be on screen in a moment. And let me know what you think. If you want to see more videos like this, I've got loads I could do. I've got loads of old tests I could talk through and people have asked me to do this. So this is following up on a request. Many people gave it a thumbs up on how this idea was because I've never done this before. Never done a voiceover on a video before like this. And people have been asking me for it. So I thought, yeah, I shall give the people what they want. So we pull up, we secure the car, and then I'll give the people the result. So, yeah, that's it. That's a good pass. And if you look at the pupil's face, he's quite happy to have passed, which is always good to see. I always find it interesting how <laughs> so he looks at the camera and kind of nods a lot. Um, but I think it's funny how people react so calmly to passing the driving test. I remember when I passed mine, I, I was like ecstatic. And, you know, it's unusual for me because I don't always show a lot of emotion. And I was so happy when I passed, I was jumping up and down. And it's always funny how some people just don't care. It's like, oh yeah, we've passed. And then they get on the phone to the parents, oh, I've passed, passed my test, yeah. What are you doing tonight then? <laughs> I always find that really funny how people react different ways. I've had people screaming. I've had people jumping up in the air. 
I remember people called Andrew, who may well be watching this, and I remember he asked the examiner, can we have a hug? And uh, he hugged the examiner. It was actually the same woman I spoke about earlier when I was talking about the people that went the wrong way when I hadn't asked them to. So yeah, just running back over a few of the highlights or lowlights of the test as it were. So if you've enjoyed this video, check out the other videos on the screen now. Remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. And I'll see you again soon for more videos.